Hi, I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And um, we've decided that we don't have to talk about the same things all yeah, the time. No we can just ramble on about anything that we feel like talking about. Mm. So um, we, we uh, talked a little bit about uh, art. Yeah. So, uh, so like I mean, to... we're going to talk about this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. What's yeah. that? Where did that come from? I don't know. It's been behind us quite a while. But... I guess the behind me who painting. Do you, who do you think did that? Mm, I did. How long ago? Whew. Uh, quite a while ago. <laughs> about 20 years ago. Ah. Um, and that's, that's what I used to do. Mm. That was my job. For a few years, I was an artist. I um, had a one-man show in London at mm. the Drion Gallery. Um, you know, a few shows here and there. Scraped by through the generosity of friends and family <laughs> uh, for about four years after leaving college. Mm. But I, I came to a, I think, a, a pretty different view of of art yeah. to, to most people because nowadays we, we've you know, I watched it in the 70s, it was, I was at college mm. in the late 70s. And, um, you know, conceptualism, ephemeralism, the short yes. sort of things were coming along. And, I, you know, I've got every respect for that. That's absolutely fine. Mm. People want to... Uh, unmake their beds. Yeah, or, or blow into a paper bag or... Yeah. Whatever they want to do, it's great. Mm. <clears throat> in fact, conceptualism was started by a guy called... You, know, you could trace it back to Marcel Duchamp. Mm. You can trace everything back to Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> pop art, pop art, surrealism, <laughs> you name it. Ready maids. Ready maids, <laughs> Obrit Trouvé. It's all dear old Marcel. He was mm. a great bloke. But conceptualism, as, as we think of it, started in the 60s, probably with Bruce Nauman. And mm. his objection was that paintings had just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and they were for very rich people in museums. Mm. And he wanted. Rather than going, oh, we could make small paintings, because you know, simple answer. Yeah, he started to think about engaging people in a way that wouldn't cost them a fortune and and would have an ah. experience. So he started putting so up art for the general public. Yeah, yeah, art for everyone. And the piece I remember is where he he put up plywood boards, and you'd sort of walk between them. You'd sort ah, of so, so you'd have an experience. Art. Yeah. And it, it's worth saying that, that conceptualism came out of political socialism. It ah. came out of an idea of equality mm. um, and uh, rich people not being very good for us. Yeah. Um, that's <clears throat> never been my persuasion politically, I must say. Mm. Um, I, I'm not inclined that way to either the right or the left. I like the middle. Yes. The middle is a good place. But... Uh, so you had a guy who uh, wrote ideas for 200 paintings, burnt the notebook and sold the ashes. Mm. Um, and it, art becomes yeah. about thinking, yeah, about I thoughts. Did. And you can see that that was you know, the important thing that the late 19th century artists had added, that mm. they were saying, well, it shouldn't just be a picture of some cute little babies falling from the sky. It should be about something. It should have some meaning. Mm. So Impressionism was a direct reflection of the landscape yeah. um, painted on plein air, out in the open. Mm. They weren't the first people to do it. The Barbizon School had done it. And Emile Boudin, who, who taught Monet, mm. was painting on the beach when <laughs> Monet first met him. So, you know, yeah. the, the mythology that's been created is a mythology. Mm. But they, you know, Monet determinedly would take a wheelbarrow full of wet canvases out and change them every half mm. hour according so to the light of the day. Light. Just yeah. amazing. And the later series paintings, mm. the haystacks or the Rouen Cathedral facades are really gorgeously beautiful, I think. And in his paintings in his, his garden at Giovanni, um, you know, where you make your own subject matter and then paint it. And I often mm. looked at that and thought, why not just paint it? Yeah. You know, but, yeah. you know, it's a nice garden. And the Nymphaeas, the water lilies, which I finally ah, had the yes. great pleasure of seeing in Paris in 2017, are just wonderful. Yeah. Um, they're, they're my Sistine Chapel. I'm not that keen on the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, but, they but do it. Yeah. The Nymphaeas just chills me out. Yeah. But I think that, 
you know, one of the important things I came to in discussion with other artists was, was why are we doing this? What do we do this for? Mm. And it, it becomes just to have some kind of emotional impact on people to, to get them to... Ah, and fortunately, it feels to me that a lot of the emotional impact conceptual artists are trying to get is disgust. Mm. That that's considered valuable in the work because it makes a certain point come across. And it's often very patronising. It, it, it's the thought of making you aware of something because mm. you're stu too stupid to be aware of it. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about somebody like Ai Weiwei, mm. I, I have tremendous respect for him because he's risking his life doing what yeah. he's doing, being in China. Mm. And he is trying to get people to think through his work, but you know things can go wrong, like the yeah. ceramic beads oh. at, at the Tate Modern ah, that people were walking that. over, and of course they were releasing uh, toxic fumes <laughs> or particles into the atmosphere so that was not really aesthetically very vital but mm. I remember spending three days talking with a great friend of mine who is, is a brilliant sculptor and we talked about what we wanted to get out of our art and, mm. and I kind of brought it down to you know I want people to to look at something and can feel joy yeah and it's only by talking about it I realized that what happened in the 20th century well from the late 19th century onwards was expressionism <clears throat> which pushed into angst, mm. anxiety, and, you know, yeah. waking people up to all the horrors of the world. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure we're all aware of the horrors of yeah. the world and our own. And having something in your house to remind you of the horrors of the world mm. isn't especially appealing to me. Well, and, and you just take a simple point that, that if you had the choice between having, a, you know, a nice vase of tulips on your kitchen mm. table or some dog mass you know which would you choose it depends if i had rich friends i choose the dog mess because mm. i could show that to them and so i feel... paid a million dollars yeah. for this you know um I, I mean i was watching a collector and um she got some trainers on on the floor in her gallery yeah. space and um she got into this conversation about how she how much money she would paid for this pair of trainers because they'd come from this artist mm. now this is like the Picasso story. I don't know if it's true, but Picasso was asked to paint something and, mm. and told that it, on a wall and told that he'd be given an amount of money. So he put a dot yeah. and signed it Picasso. And that's conceptual art, isn't it? Yeah. Um, sometimes you get something like Maurizio Catalan, mm. whose work I, I just, it's brilliant, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I love Maurizio Catalan. You know, the, no, I, God, is that? makes a statement like uh, the Pope being struck down by meteorite or what's the extreme one? Thunderbolt. Hitler praying at Auschwitz. It actually wasn't Auschwitz, was it? It was. He's praying in front of some, some church doors or something, isn't it? Yeah. So I remember it. Or the children hanging from the tree. <laughs> Which um, uh, somebody uh, climbed up and attempted to... And then uh, fell out of down. the tree. And then, yeah. And then... Um, wasn't he arrested or something? The person but... was arrested for defacing the artwork. Yeah. But but he just made, um, you know, lifelike casts from poor oh, children. I, I and... love the one of the grandma in the freezer. Yeah. That's... The, a guy asked said he wanted something that would remind him of his grandma. <laughs> and so he, he got a, a fridge. When you open the door, the grandma <laughs> sitting is. inside it. Which would remind you of your grandma. But I, I'd like to think of my grandma more warmly than that, yeah. I must say. I'd hate Put to her think in the oven. It. Well, no, <laughs> just a nice armchair, oh, right. you know, in the living room. Yeah. Basically. My grandma was very nice. My, mm. my grandma, Sarah Annie, was very nice. And my, my other grandma, my mm. father's mum, was horrible. Mm. Um, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Connie. Um, <clears throat> so I'm descended from a saint and a narcissist, basically. <laughs> oh, good combination. Mm. Um, Catalan also, I mean, recently there's been the thing of the golden toilet, I ah, called America. Called America, which has been stolen uh, from an exhibition. It's valued at four million pounds. Yeah. This toilet, um, and uh, it's even been suggested that Catalan himself may have arranged the <laughs> robbery. And I don't think that's true. I don't think mm. he needed to. But it is fascinating that for years he had an actor go and pretend to be him at um, meetings. Yeah, <laughs> and I think all of that. That really works for me. All of yeah. what he's doing is, you know, there was a point where he had his dealer. Um, the, part of the contract was that the dealer had to be sellotaped to the wall. Ah, yeah. And it, yeah what's it? Does and he have a heart he attack? He had a heart attack. 
So that's not so good. There was another one where the, the gallery owners had to dress up in tiger suits throughout the whole exhibition. And I think he's poking fun in the right way yeah. and doing something useful. But what's the aesthetic value of this? And should we be concerned about aesthetic value? Can we leave that up to the advertisers and, and the cinema? No, I don't. I mean, cinema, surely you can have aesthetic value, but I don't think it should just be. Hmm. Um, there should be a form of art which is aesthetic hmm. and technique-based even. Well, that's the other sad thing. That even by the time I went to college, technique was in the 70s. Technique was no longer being mm. taught. I, and I learned technique. You know, I found um, a guy in the college who actually did know how to paint. He just mm. wasn't teaching it. In fact, he himself had stopped painting seven years before, and I got him painting again. Yeah. I got him to paint in front of the class, which he mm. hadn't done. And I, I read... Um, the the 1940s Pittman's Guide to Oil Painting. That's where I cracked technique. Then yeah. I started looking at, you know, I, I know how Monet painted. He painted on a pink background. Mm. Quite unusual. Painters will usually use a, a, a red earth, you know, a kind of rusty colour. That's a tradition mm. through the Renaissance or Terra Verte, which is a green mid-tone, mm. so that your lights and dark show. Yeah. But I found out how Rembrandt painted and you've, yeah. you know, accompanied me on uh, I've seen now I think there are about 300 Rembrandts and I've I've oh. seen about 90 of them face yeah. to face around the world I mean the girl standing in water in the National Gallery that's just, just the most beautiful yeah. thing and he was married to her mm. and uh, you feel it you know mm. that it's just a little painting it's just gorgeous mm. whenever I go to the National Gallery there are two paintings I always spend 20 minutes with one of them is Caravaggio's Supper to Maus, in which all the shadows are wrong, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it has light in it. Yeah, because uh, Rembrandt was influenced by Caravaggio. He was a Caravaggisti, <laughs> briefly, you know, up to those things. But the other is the girl standing in water. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was in St. Petersburg and I managed to see the Danai, uh, the Rape of Danai, which ah. is gold coming down. And it, it's yeah. famous also because. Uh, um, it was slashed and it took ah. 10 years to repair. But, you know, well, don't take it out on Rembrandt. You know, if you're annoyed about the communist state. Or you're a conceptual you know, artist. Just... Get, have a go at, a, you know, a statue of Stalin or something. Yeah. Don't don't attack Paul, you know, what Rembrandt. Have done? Yeah, what's, what's Rembrandt van der Rijn ever done to you? Um, I mean, it's kind of interesting, isn't he? Because he was very narcissistic. Right? Oh, yeah. I, I knew how great he was from being about... 15. What was the documentary series we saw on him? Which kept uh, quoting him. And he was basically telling us how I'm great he was. I'm brilliant. <laughs> yeah. But he was. And, yeah. you know, he was right about it. it I mean, I, I'm glad I didn't know him because I'd have found that a bit <laughs> odious, but a um, bit of a boaster. But he was. He was. He did things that others can't do because his system of painting was quite different, that, mm. that he would actually use a white lead paint, which is very thick, mm. called an impasto or paste in painter's terms. And he would pretty much sculpt the picture in white lead mm. on you know, a, a darker ground and then use glazers, transparent layers mm. of paint, to um, emphasize everything. And uh, if you look at the early paintings, there are portraits, and you'll see somebody with one of these incredible elaborate yeah. lace ruffs on, and it's got sort of a thousand brush marks to make. Mm. By the end of his life, you'd, I've actually seen some of the brushes. Take these great big straw brushes, and uh, all brushes were round until the 19th century, by the way. The flat brush was a, an innovation. <laughs> great big straw brush, and he'd go, God, and there would just... be, and if it yeah. didn't work, he'd scrape it off and have another <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah. But when he got it, he could then use glazers going in different ways to mm. get shadows and accents. Okay. It worries me that there are now, you could probably learn those techniques in Russia still. Mm. Um, the Courtauld Institute in London, I should think, teaches them. Mm. And I think it's, it's called something like the Angels School in Florence that still teaches them. But most painters aren't taught. They're just like, here's some plastic paint, get on with it. Mm. You know, they don't, you know, I use linen, I, I use Alkid, which is a, specialized form of oil paint i use many many layers to 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 achieve an effect um i guess that the place where i differed a lot you know i started painting in the 70s was that 
I, I wanted to actually not make images, not, mm. you know, I started out painting portraits and landscapes yeah. and things like that. and Copying the things you liked. It, it? Yeah, I did a couple of copies, but I, I you know, I do drawings outside ah, and, yeah. um, you know, being at college, I did a year of drawing a, a lady with no clothes on mm. um, in various ways. And, you know, I, I studied the painter Titian mm. particularly as, as a, a youngster and he, he talked about glazers 30 or 40 was how mm. he got his colour effect. Remember we were in the Prado in Madrid. Is the Charles V his, actually? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Charles V on horseback is... is uh, you can see Titian. the colour that he... Yeah, he, he gets these weird almost metal colours which only El Greco mm. would later get and he was... Definitely weird, but, but they are amazing paintings. Domenikos Theotokopoulos. You can see why they called him the Greek. Mm. Um, but I studied Titian, and, and so you, you basically you do a grisaille, which is a, a monochrome painting, mm. almost like a black and white photograph or a sepia photograph, and you then put thin layers of colour over it, mm. and that gives you your final effect. Um, sometimes things go wrong. And over yeah. time, the paint layers change. You often, if you look closely in um, portraits, you know, that are 200 or more years old, which mm. means that the oil paint has actually uh, oxidized. Oil paint doesn't dry, mm. it oxidizes. It takes 100 to 150 years to be finished doing that. So it's still liquid to yeah. some extent till then. And you'll sometimes be able to see the blue underpainting ah. beneath skin or even green. Mm. There's a, a Jean Auguste Dominique Ingres painting of mm. Napoleon, um, and he had to run away to Italy because Napoleon hated the picture so much. But it's a famous <laughs> one of Napoleon like this. When you mm. see it in real life, Napoleon's face is green now, <laughs> no, which is about right, I yeah. think. Um, but I learned those techniques. But then I became fascinated by this idea in Da Vinci. Da Vinci talked about um, when he needed inspiration, he would look into the flames in a fire, or he would look the moss mm. and wall until images began to appear and I, I started to think well what what happens if we have a kind of abstraction where you let the viewer construct the images yeah and that you know has been my guiding principle mm. these many years that so people will look at my work I had one painting when I was at college and one friend came round and looked at it and said oh that, that's hell and a week later without any conversation another of the students mm. on the course came over and said oh that's paradise <laughs> And that's when I realised that you could actually, you know, that the spectator, the viewer, is always a part mm. of the work of art. Yeah, so uh, like with the Da Vinci looking into the fire, the fire is something beautiful, but how it's perceived depends. Well, you'll see on the image, images yeah, you'll within see, it. Yeah, and things. what I found is that people will see what's in their own heads. Mm. Um, and I, I was interested in German Gestalt psychology, not mm. in to any deep level, <laughs> but I, I understood that, that they had this thing about the figure and the field, the way that you see something represented. Mm. Um, and there is, the brain will seek to, or the mind, will mm. seek to decode things. So if you see two dots, you'll see them as eyes. Mm. It's just that way. And so I realised that you could play these little tricks by, you know, I became, my interest was in colour and form and um, where there's this doctrine that abstract painting is called non-objective. Yes. And this comes from people like Mondrian, who basically say nothing in the painting must look like anything in reality. So yeah. let's have a black bar this way and that, that looks like windows to me. Oh, Mondrian. no. And you have... Uh, you know, white and the three primary colours, yeah. um, red, yellow and Not blue. Not much you can do. <laughs> and it became a dogma that overwhelmed art up until the First mm. World War. There were really exciting things happening, particularly for me, the work of Vasily Kandinsky uh, and of Franz Marc, who were both mm. in Munich at that time and in 1912 had exhibited as the Blue Rider Group, along with Paul mm. Clay, August Macker. Um, Gabriela Munta and um, Schoenberg, the, uh, the yeah, he the exhibited, poster. and uh, Jolensky, yeah, the, the paintings are absolutely horrible. Ah. But um, 
they were trying to find some beautiful thing that was not of this world. Yeah. And then you get this this rule that says, no, it mustn't look like anything. And I said, well, mm. why not go the other way? Why not go, I don't care what it looks like. And yeah. people will interpret the painting and, you know, see for themselves what's there. Uh, my mum, uh, bless her, used to say that, that she liked my paintings because every time you looked at them, you could find something new. Whereas, mm. uh, and I would say that is true of a Rembrandt as well or any... You know, yeah, any. or a Botticelli or anything, mm. a Monet, they'll they'll be more to find. Yeah, but a lot of things are just like poster art. That once yeah. you've got the image, you unless the poster was made by Toulouse Lautrec, in which case it'll be fantastic, and you can keep looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. it's like a lot of the conceptual stuff ending up in the warehouse, and it doesn't really matter because you've got a photo of it. And since it's the idea that matters, not the aesthetics of it. Well, and this actually happened to me. I was in California and. I think it was 1990 or 1991. Mm. And whenever I went, I'd, I'd take, you know, I was there on other business, but I'd go around the galleries. Mm. Um, I was there for six weeks in 86, and I went to 77 galleries in California and you know, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And uh, the general response was that, that the gallery owners really liked the work, which yeah. was pleasing. But I was taking them watercolours, and there's not enough markup on watercolours to be worth selling it. Silly me. So the next time in '88, I, I took um, good quality slides of oil paintings, mm. and the question I was asked repeatedly was, "Do you live in California?" And the answer was no. Yeah. And they were only doing people who lived in California. <laughs> that that week. Yeah. Then I came back in '91, and I think it was '91, and one gallery after another had Russian installations in. And under Soviet communism, art was so badly forbidden that if you were caught doing it, and it wasn't mm. socialist realism, then you'd be sent to the gulag. <laughs> and uh, so that's quite a penalty. So the artists started making their studios their work of art. And their studios looked like every artist's studio I've ever known, a complete chaos. You know, mm. Mondrian's wasn't. It was very tidy. And okay. He used to dress in a suit to paint, actually. <laughs> Um, but they were just messy studios. And after about the fourth or fifth of these, I, I said to the gallery owner, um, let me see if I've got this right. This will be exhibited. There's a blueprint of it to show how to put it out again. Photographs will be taken. Then it will all be boxed and wrapped up and put in a vault. And it will be sold on without ever coming out of the vault again. And the dealer said yes. And at that point, you start to worry, what is the meaning of this yeah. anymore? Now, I have nothing but respect for the Russian artists who mm. did this because they were, as is Ai Weiwei, they were playing with their lives mm. doing this. You know, they were making a statement that was important. Take it out of the context of a fascistic society like the Soviet Union. Does it have any meaning? Yeah. A messy bed? <laughs> um Apparently so, because yeah. that messy bed's now worth millions. I, found it, I mean, I, I heard somebody talking the other day saying that um, you have to consider the context of art, and that's what makes conceptual art valuable. But something like Rembrandt, it doesn't matter that it was painted all those years ago. It has meaning now. And surely that if, if something is locked in its context, that as soon as it's yesterday, it has no meaning. Yeah, exactly. And it... It is going to be interesting to see what remains of our time. There's also a notion that anything beautiful is sentimental mm. and that, that we should be aware of Auschwitz at all times and, and not try and cheer each other up. But I'm still there. I'd rather have the vase of flowers than the dog mats. Yeah. It's just me. Don't like the smell of it. You know, okay. flowers smell nice. And there are so few artists, you know, now you're considered a decorative artist. Yeah if you do anything attractive. Yeah. And that seems such a, a limitation upon the human range yeah. that everything's got to be it, again, miserable. It, it, yeah, it's, it's like saying can't um, represent anything mm. or it has to be really miserable. Mm. It's anything which tries to dictate what art can be to such a degree is, I don't know, I don't think you should do that. Well, my, my 
then friend, uh, Chris McHugh, was at, at Manchester University um, studying fine arts, and he was working on a big piece. And the tutor came up and, and shook his head and said, but I, I don't see any angst in it. <laughs> and Chris said, oh, good, because <laughs> I didn't put any yeah. in it. You know? um, it, it I, think it's, I think it's very serious because the skills of painting are being lost. It isn't easy to do. Um, you know, it does require training and practice. Yeah. The same thing happened with music, that, that I, I think after the Second World War, that there was such disgust at, at what had happened, mm. that, that the, you know, there was a slump after the First World War. And the arts, you know, there was some progression. You, you, you've got some fantastic, um, particularly English composers um, mm. in the interwar years, um, Bax, um, Broughton, uh, people, you know, Holst, mm. uh, Vaughan Williams, yeah, yeah, they're, but they're a, Ivor Gurney, they're uh, Finzi, they're a, just a horde, it's called mm. the English Renaissance. And then the Second World War happens and there's only Benjamin Britten. And Britten yeah. is being ripped apart by the music yeah. critics. Uh, and you go back and say, well, what's actually valuable musically from the 1950s and 60s? And you go, well, Benjamin Britten. Yeah, that he through through him. More than anything, you know, there's nobody else <laughs> yeah. that I can think of. But it had all been killed that, mm. that now we've got to have Stockhausen syndrome, as, yeah. as my friend Always Christian and I call it, where you'd, you'd have the note C 147 times. And it be, the arts became about something in your head mm. rather than something in your head and in your heart and an object. Yeah. And, you know, now we're seeing since the 60s, there's been a move back in painting where, sorry, in, in music, where composers like Gorecki or Arvo Pett or um, John Tavener started to look back to medieval and Renaissance music and started to compose again. Yeah. But you realise that by the time you got to Stravinsky, through Rimsky-Korsakov and the Russian school, that or, or Ravel in, in France, that there'd been an incredible development you know mm. being able to sit down and write for 80 instruments and make them all fit yeah. together it's not that easy and the skills uh in fact von williams studied with ravel to, to learn orchestration um the skills have pretty much been lost in the western world because it was like well now we're going to bang the cello up and down on the ground and make scraping <laughs> noises so yeah. you know it, it's one of the it's one of the few benefits of the awful russian system that they, they had Mosfilm, this incredible cinema, you know, where Tarkovsky and oh, yes, uh, Mikhailkov. Um, no, he, no, no, he's a, he was a politician a, with a ah, funny mind. Oh, yeah, himself. that's right. I saw an interview with him. Yeah. That's why his name's in my head. You think he's arty because he's got like that ink blot on yeah, his head. Yeah, uh, yeah, he has. It is quite cool. It's like a Roshosh painting. Roshosh. 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 Um, but yeah, Tarkovsky's work or. Yeah. Um, uh, Nikita Mikhailkov's amazing it uh, wrote a Mikhail mechanical piece. Mikhailkov. Non-played piece of mechanical piano. Unfinished, Unfinished piece for mechanical piano, it's called, and, and, and Oblomov. And yeah. He, he won a, an Oscar um, for his uh, movie about Stalin, hmm. Burnt by the Sun, which is also pretty good, but Unfinished Pieces, yeah. just and Oblomov, they're wonderful. But they flourished mm. until, until they had to run away because the the fascists or communists, they call themselves, worked out that they were taking the mickey, you know, mm. that they shouldn't be doing this. Um, so Tarkovsky came to the West and um, Mikhailkov made a film in, in Italy, I think. Um, there's another film called Private Conversation by Mikhailkov, yeah. which is, is quite wonderful. And his brother, who's not called Mikhailkov, um, Andrei or something, made um, The Inner Circle, which mm. is about Stalin's projectionist who absolutely loved yeah. Stalin. And a friend of mine, when he left Scientology after 20 years in the Inner Sea organization, said that watching that film was exactly <laughs> how they look to Hubbard. They see yeah. all of the craziness that's happening. You know, mm. He'd be in the room when Stalin decided he was going to have somebody killed. You yeah. know? But, oh, Stalin was such a great <laughs> man. Um, but similarly with music, they preserved the mm. compositional systems and, and the orchestration. So, you know, you had Shostakovich and uh, Kachaturian, 
uh, who had a bit of a hard, they all had a bit of a hard time yeah. along the way, uh, Prokofiev. And that continues. Mm. So they still have the traditional ways ah. of doing things. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I think that we have suffered more from an emotional malaise that nothing can be good anymore after, yeah. you know, what Stalin did to the Kulaks, what Hitler did to the Jews, the Romanis, the blacks, the communists, mm. um, and what Mao did to everybody could get his nasty little hands on. 70 million people died as a consequence of Mao Zedong, who is mm. still right there in yeah, Tiananmen plastic. Square. There's that huge picture of this ah. awful man, and it's all taken out of history. Mm. Artists are here not simply to comment on their own emotional lives, which mm. I think expressionism wandered over into. Yeah. They're here to, to celebrate the wonder of being human. Mm. And to I think we all, we're all artists. We all have genius of some kind, talent of some mm. kind. Um, and that that should be expressed. It might be expressed in pie baking. Yeah. And I don't approve of pie baking because I'm gluten intolerant. Yeah. I find it offensive. <laughs> yes, this is J.P. Sears material. It's offensive. <laughs> I don't want your second-hand <clears throat> gluten. That's it, yeah. You keep it to yourself. But I do think there's a place for a... You know, I think we've we've stopped thinking. Mm. And so seeing people queuing up to... It's like I, I saw the uh, Jackson Pollock exhibition at the Tate Modern... Um, few years ago now and there's a piece on my johnatech.com website about it and I'd always uh, thought Pollock was pretty good because mm -hmm. I'd seen the little pictures in the books you know yeah and then when I saw um, blue poles and lavender mist in real life they're dreadful they're a complete mess mm -hmm. they're exactly what you'd expect if a guy drank a couple of bottles of whiskey and then staggered around with he dribbling paint. <laughs> oh yeah he did oh yeah <laughs> uh, I think um I think the movie about him is uh, Ed Harris's movie about him is fantastic mm. and, and shows you. And I, what I saw was, as an artist and somebody who has some experience of art history was a pasticha, a, a, somebody who'd copied the paintings of Ashil Gorky, mm. copied the paintings of Picasso, uh -huh. and then got very drunk and that. dribbled <laughs> paint all over. A the drunk place. replica then. And what fascinated me was that as I crept up behind people, you get this thing where you get two people talking. Ah. Yes. And one of them is the expert, you know, <laughs> and he's, he's telling the other one. And and they're saying, you know, just how incredibly wonderful this is and how expressive it is and what mm. have you. And no, he got really drunk, <laughs> blind drunk, yeah. and he did this. If you look to the work of Mark Toby, mm. which Toby yeah, started selling Toby. pictures because he got mistaken for a member of the Abstract Expressionists. Ah. And he was actually the generation before them. He'd studied calligraphy in Japan mm. in the 1930s, 20s and 30s, I think. And his, when you see him alongside a, a, a Pollock in a book, then you'll see, you know, they, they, they look quite similar. Mm. But his are actually this big. <laughs> and uh, the famous white writing that he did. Mm. Um, so you have somebody who is a very skilled calligrapher, who is a very controlled mark, mm. being compared with somebody who got very drunk and dribbled paint all over yeah. the place. And uh, that leads into another story altogether, which is the way that the Central Intelligence Agency were involved in promoting abstract expressionism through Clement Greenberg, the critic, uh, because they feared that France would fall to the communists. And so the center of the art world had to move to New York. And so mm. they really did. There's a lovely book about it, and I'll get the name of it for Spike so she can put it on here. Mm. Um, which goes through the documents, in, you know, because you can get them through Freedom of Information. You can get these documents, which show uh, this huge expenditure on making Pollock, you know, a world-leading <laughs> artist. Now, I knew Bill Gear, who was in Paris at the end mm. of uh, World War Two, and you know, he's when I, you know, he, he had work in twenty-five national collections by the time I knew him. But it was all work from his 40s period. He couldn't say ah. the later stuff. But he was in Paris, and so he knew the Takist people, who are actually where abstract expressionism comes from. They stole oh. this idea um, of 
you know, the mark, the facture, the signature, mm. the handwriting of the artist. And their stuff's actually quite good, some of it. And that was grafted out. Um, the painter André Masson visited New York and brought together members of this group. And the French were played down. Um, they were doing the innovative thinking and the innovative work. Mm. Um, but, that, you know, a lot of money went to support this. If you look to contemporary conceptualism, then you have to say Charles Saatchi. Yes. Saatchi, King. at one point, was the kingpin. He and his brother Morris were, were at the center of advertising. Mm. They ran Saatchi and Saatchi, for example. <laughs> uh, their uh, man, Tim Bell, Lord Bell, um, spent most of his time lying on uh, the carpet at 10 Downing Street, working for uh, Margaret Thatcher. Huh? Uh, they devised the famous Labour Isn't Working poster and things. That was the first time in British politics that the, the PR people, had actually, advertising people, had actually come in to take things on. In mm. fact, James Callaghan, who was the Labour Prime Minister replaced by Margaret Thatcher, said the Labour Party will never huh? use advertising agencies. So Tony Blair. Mm. He wasn't listening to that. He had, uh, I think he had five spin doctors immediately around him saying, how do I say this? How do I get this over? How do I con the people into not realising I'm doing this? Um, mm. And sadly, they all wrote books about it, Philip Gold, Derek Draper, um, uh, Alistair Campbell, mm. where they gleefully exposed the way they were conning us, mm. uh, which I don't think is very nice. Charles Saatchi decided to create uh, a British conceptualism and so mm. he promoted Damien Hirst and Tracy Emer. Yeah. And you find that advertising does work. Ah. That if you pretend that something's worth a great deal of money, so, the emperor has nothing on. Yeah, no but, clue. Uh, wow, look at those silks and fabrics. You know? yeah. Unfortunately, that meant that people stopped buying paintings. Mm. And... Um, yeah, so either following what the CIA was supporting and then into what had was uh, supported by the PR people mm. yeah. spinned yeah and in psychology they talk about social proof which is the idea of compliance with the people around you and so you know I, I went to a wonderful show of Monet uh, series paintings mm. at the Royal Academy and uh, <clears throat> when I go to show I, I, I walk all the way around fairly swiftly mm. and pick up which pieces I'm going to want to look at. Mm. And there were two paintings in the show that I really wanted to look at. One was a Rouen Cathedral facade from, I think, 1891, somewhere around there. Mm. And Monet had actually found that he could get a room looking directly at the front of the medieval, the Gothic wow. cathedral at Rouen. Mm. And because uh, there were no planning regulations back then, it was quite close to the... <laughs> So he could, instead Just, of having his canvases blown about him, he in had the wind, a nice protective a, shelter. Yeah. And so he did this series of paintings. And I was stood looking at that and um, heard the, the wiseacre saying to his, uh, his friend, Yeah, you see, uh, Monet's technique was not necessarily all that good. <laughs> now, I was looking at a painting that had been brushed down with white lead strokes mm. to, so that he could paint over them and just reach the, the peaks of the lines so that you've got this... He said he wanted to paint the air an inch in front mm -hmm. of the facade, and he would change the canvas every half hour to get the change in light. The light yeah. yeah, so his interest in light. Now, so I'm standing there transfixed by this thing, which this guy's dissing, you know, it's like oh, rubbish. Yeah. The other painting was of the drum bridge at Giverny, his garden at Giverny. And it was in spring when the willow tree was just coming into, you know, it's kind of exploding green fire, yeah. firework, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, as Dylan Thomas put it. And I, so this I'm mesmerised and mm -hmm. uh, the, some other wise guy is explaining to his friend, yeah, he really wasn't very good at perspective. You know, so so yeah. there are a lot of clever people like that. Paul Clay gave the, the best piece of advice about painting, which we will share with you. Uh, as we wind this down, wind it down. And that is, the only thing you need to understand a painting is a chair, mm. because otherwise you'll get tired. You look at things for long enough, you absorb them. Um, 
it's great what other people think about it, mm. and it's lovely to listen to people's opinions. But in the end, it needs to touch you. Yeah. And and it can do, but mm. give it time. Get a chair. That's mm. our advice for today. So this has been a digression upon something that we not talked about on the channel before. Mm. And um, but we will talk about it again, yeah. especially if you subscribe, press the little notification bell, like it, write a comment saying more like this, please. <laughs> tell us, tell us what kind of shoes Kandinsky wore. I'll put a comment in that says that. Good. Yeah. And um, phew, this has been a long one. Um, I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And. Thank you so much for your time. We have enjoyed your company tremendously. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.